Welcome back. It's time now for the France 24 debate. Today, we're examining the three-day summit of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, better known by the acronym ASEAN. Well, those talks have now wrapped up. Well, the virtual talks were hosted by Brunei, which currently holds the rotating chair of the 10-nation bloc. Before we examine what emerged, let me just tell you a little bit more about that bloc, which was established in 1967. Let's start by looking at who the 10 member states are. There's Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. Well, these 10 member states represent about 655 million people. That's roughly 8.5% of the world population. And together, they cooperate in a number of different areas, notably on economic, political, security and educational matters. Let's have a look at the uh, blocks flag in more detail. There you go. 10 stalks of rice, one for each of the 10 Southeast Asian countries in the bloc. Well, as of next year, it's going to be Cambodia that takes the chair. Well, there was lots on the agenda there at the ASEAN summit, but perhaps uh, one or two of the headline stories from that uh, set of talks was the bloc's decision to exclude Myanmar's junta chief. Well, also under discussion there were territorial claims in the South China Sea, where Beijing and several Southeast Asian nations have overlapping claims. And then there was, of course, the COVID pandemic. Well, a key development from that summit was a pair of agreements with Australia and China to upgrade their relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN. And finally, another significant feature of those three days of virtual talks addresses from the US president, as well as the leaders of China, India, Australia, New Zealand, Russia, South Korea and Japan. Well, as I mentioned, Brunei holds the rotating chair of ASEAN, Let's listen to what the Sultan of Brunei had to say about the outcome of the summit. Over the past three days, we have also made progress with regard to our external relations. I'm especially pleased that ASEAN has agreed to establish comprehensive strategic partnership with both Australia and China, which will foster more meaningful substantial and mutually beneficial relationships going forward. Okay, the Sultan of Brunei speaking there. So what role does ASEAN play in regional affairs? Is the bloc size of that role, is that is it likely to grow? And what specifically was achieved in this three-day summit? Those are some of the questions I'll be putting to our panel today. Here with us in the studio is David Camerou, uh, Honorary Senior Research Fellow and Adjunct Professor at Sciences Po here in Paris. A very warm welcome to you. Also with me in the studio is France 24 senior reporter Cyril Payen, who spent many years as regional correspondent in Southeast Asia for France 24. Welcome to you. I'm also joined by Jean-Michel Lacombe, who is the former French ambassador to Bangladesh and Myanmar. A very warm welcome uh, to you. Let's start by talking uh, a bit more about the background of ASEAN, how ASEAN uh, was born. David, can I just ask you to tell us, a sort of uh, give us a potted history of how ASEAN came about in the first place? Well, ASEAN is a product of the Cold War, created in 1967 amongst initially five countries, all of which had territorial disputes with each other. I was created also and supported by the West as a kind of bulwark against, uh, against communism. Uh, remember, there was a war in Vietnam, in La- Laos and Cambodia at the time. Um, and it has been incredibly successful in, as a security community, that is, in creating a sense of, con- of confidence amongst the different members. It, it, it was set up to deal with economic questions, but in fact, that's been rather unimportant for ASEAN. Uh, But it created the political environment for those countries to take off economically. And and then uh, as time went on, um, with the end of the Cold War, it successfully in 1995 with the entry of Vietnam, 1997 Cambodia and Myanmar in 1998, um, uh, sorry, Laos in in 1998 uh, Cambodia. Uh, enlarged to include all of the countries which are geographically known as as Southeast Asia. So um, I then claimed to have this kind of central role from 2006, that that regional constructions in the Asia-Pacific and now the Indo-Pacific should all be a re- revolve around ASEAN. And this summit is proof of that ability because uh, we see that the regional partners, the United States, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, China particularly, and Australia are all there as what they call dialogue partners. Uh, And so the the, the outside world gives a lot of support to ASEAN. In fact, 
it's not well known, but two thirds to more than 90% of the budget of the Secretariat is paid for by foreign countries, including, including the European Union. Um, so it has this kind of central role and it's been very successful in creating a climate of security and confidence between the member countries. What it has been unable to do, and the case of Myanmar today is proof of that, is to deal with problems within member states. Okay, so that's something new that they're having to get used to, perhaps. Perhaps the that's first. Right. Not they, they did lost. that when the countries were, no, were not yet members in Cambodia mm. and Burma prior to 1995, 1997. But once the country is a member, then there are no real tools to bring about changes of behaviour in the member states. Okay, I'm going to pick up on this issue of entry requirements in just a moment, because that's quite interesting. I'd like to just ask you, though, Cyril, whilst you were based in uh, Southeast Asia for many years as a correspondent, I'm assuming you saw plenty of evidence of ASEAN at work. What, what sort of role do you, did you see them playing? Well, to be very frank with you, and just as a follow-up as what just David said, is I was, yeah, for two decades based in Bangkok, so I can tell you that ASEAN summit were so boring, there's <laughs> nothing uh, come and... and all my my, 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 my my apologies to the members and the debate. It was very boring. It was a very a club, inner club, where people were based on non-interference because this is one of the key of the, 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 the strategy and the statements, the, 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 fund, the, the fundamental statement of the, the ASEAN. So there were no issues. They were indeed, as a bloc, uh, economically wise, let's say, um, a way of moving forward towards uh, China, the EU, the American, the Asia-Pacific powers. But the, the fact is, politically, it was uh, quite an empty shell. And this is how we come to now something which is really a breakthrough. But it comes regarding the crisis in Myanmar, which is uh, uh, the coup was uh, less than, a bit less than nine months ago. And this is after another two summits, we have this stance right now. So my point is... Uh, uh, it, it has been created in 1967 with the, the basis we have been, uh, the, the professor just explained, but the evolution was very slow. And now even even on the Filipino side, the one the minister in the, in the Duterte with the government said, we basically are, we were, because maybe they are changing, a club of people agreeing on non-matter things, you know. And this is very revealing of what have been ASEAN and looking to, if you compare with, with clubs like the, the EU or, you know, even the United States at the foundation. In ASEAN, people of ASEAN, the Southeast nation, uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, the nations of Southeast Asia, people just don't care about the summit. People don't care about what it is very much. So in this respect, it was very regarded as, a, as an empty shell with all respect to the, these uh, nations. And it's quite maybe evolving or moving forward a bit with the crisis in uh, Myanmar, which is also, um, I mean, uh, putting, uh, putting forward the, um, the economic crisis, a migration crisis. So it's maybe time for them just to, to wake up a bit. But it was, uh, honestly, some very boring time for me as a correspondent. ASEAN only had a legal personality in 2008 with the ratification of the ASEAN Charter, so that needs to be kept in mind. OK, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs> Let's still go to Jean-Michel Lacombe, who's, uh, uh, who's been keeping very quiet. Uh, love to hear your opinions. I mean, are, are you seeing, I mean, just seen from the outside, the sort of the VIP list of, of guests and contributors and partners at this three, day of, three days of talks, uh, this virtual three days of talks. I mean, are you seeing the influence and the reach of ASEAN perhaps growing uh, as, as time goes by? Well, <clears throat> ASEAN, until recently, always looked like a, a club of friends, agreeing on everything, provided it was not important. Now, they have a problem, and it's not the first time, they have a problem with uh, Myanmar. Uh, the Americans are drumming up support, are exerting their influence over the organization, and uh, uh, they have managed, I think, to uh, have uh, Myanmar uh, not expelled, but not invited to the ASEAN summit. It's, it's not the first time, mind you, this happening. Uh, in 10 years ago, in uh, 2006, um, this ASEAN summit was uh, scheduled to happen in Rangoon. And then again, everybody, uh, I mean, there was a general consensus that uh, this should not take place in Rangoon. 
so um, let's say that ASEAN is the mildest way of reacting to what is happening in Myanmar. Sure, we're going to be talking more about Myanmar really in the second half of, of, of the debate. But just looking at some of the uh, features of the three days of talks, I'd like to ask everybody's opinion. I mean, what, what struck you as to something that emerged from these three days of talks with, with Myanmar to one side? What was really important was that the Americans are back. Um, Trump really uh, sort of wasted all of the efforts of the Obama administration with its pivot towards Asia and the creation of something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Trump refused to jo then join. Uh, the Americans previously always had a policy of they had an economic track, they had a, 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 um, a political track, and, uh, and also a human rights kind of track in their relations. And all of that was, was more or less discarded under, under Trump, who didn't even appoint a new ambassador to, to ASEAN. So um, the, the, you know, the, the US is on the back foot, um, and and, and uh, as Hillary Clinton said, part, you know, half of diplomacy is being there. So Biden's presence in itself is an important sign that uh, they are giving uh, the value it should be given to, to ASEAN and its so-called centrality uh, in, in Asia. And I think they've understood that they don't, they should stop trying to force the countries of ASEAN to have to choose sides between the US and China. Well, I hope they've un understand that lesson because one of the constant features of the ASEAN countries is th the choice not to choose. Uh, we don't want to choose between the, U the US and China. China provides the economic mo locomotive, uh, the US provides the s security. And, and the, the common foreign policy of all of the ASEAN countries is to he hedge and to balance uh, between, uh, between the members. That really goes back to the tradition of Siam in the, in the 19th century, but I won't go into that. Because it sounds like, uh, you know, ASEAN is very much in, in the middle uh, in this battleground between Beijing and Washington jostling for influence. And I was very interested that Joe Biden, when he addressed ASEAN, uh, announced that he's giving $100 million to shore up ties with ASEAN. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what's that money going to be used for? What, does anyone have any ideas as to... Uh, the, the Australians are already putting about $93 million in. That's on it's, top of the $100 million from yeah, the US. Yeah. It's all about uh, education, uh, climate change, and, and, and health care. Uh, so it'll basically be in those areas. Uh, this is a continuation of the COVID vaccine diplomacy that we've seen, the competition between China and the US and other countries uh, in order to you know, use... Uh, COVID vaccines as, as a tool in their diplomacy. But it's also because it's, a, if I may say, it's also because it's all what is at stake with ASEAN now. The pandemic has been hurting mm. at the beginning very hard us in, in the West. But uh, when we talk about countries like Thailand, Indonesia, uh, where I've been stuck, the economy, the, um, the informal economy is uh, involving millions of people who are just devastated. And they may be using... Uh, as you very uh, cleverly said, the, the, the balance of power between China and America, but others too, because Asia-Pacific, uh, the West, the EU too, uh, just to counterbalance their failing economies and to try to re-inject some money, some confidence. And this is a way to politically also maybe explaining why the Americans are, are back, but also why we have this amazing breakthrough of the stance regarding uh, the um, exclusion of, uh, of Myanmar, which has not been decided in Hanoi, in Vientiane, in Laos, we are the kind of hardliners, the one who are never... When you, you see that the next president of the, of the ASEAN will be uh, Hun Sen of Cambodia, which is a strong man, this is the, last, uh, the least we can say, he condemned uh, yesterday the stance of Myanmar, which is like very unbelievable a few months ago. So we can see some... Uh, some I mean, they just try to find some equilibrium between the, the big powers because they are survival, it's a big word, but the, 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 the survival, the economic, the financial survival of millions of people is at stake here after the pandemic and the countries are, are just stuck. There is no tourism. This is extremely hard to understand how they will restart. So there may be a, a way of explaining how they may be a bit uh, change their strong stance regarding political and, uh, and also the, the influence of China, which is like a bit counterbalanced now. Absolutely. And what was really striking, I'm just looking at the, you know, the A to Z of the who's who of, of speakers and partners and people joining in uh, the discussions those last three days. 
I, I mean, it does look, doesn't it, uh, Jean-Michel Lacombe, like ASEAN is a club that a, a growing number of people want to sort of get in there with. Was it like that uh, when you were based in the region? Uh, and are you seeing a, a shift in perhaps attitudes towards what was perhaps before a paper tiger, but which now looks like a tiger that's uh, getting some teeth? ASEAN was created as a bulwark against China. Uh, now, the motto of ASEAN was, we don't choose, we are non-aligned. What we want to do is business. But now I think they will have to choose. Um, I consider that a fact that very important is that um, the American government has issued a statement recently saying that Taiwan, for instance, should be more present uh, in places in international organization like WHO. And this, is, this will be considered by Beijing as a, as a clear provocation. So we have a fight going on, and I think ASEAN will have to choose even if they get divided, as, as it was pointed out quite clearly. Um, you have on one hand countries like Cambodia, which is a Chinese colony, and you have countries like Singapore, which are, at least to say, uh, very different. So um, if those pressure go on, I don't think uh, um, ASEAN uh, will be very useful because they don't want to be pushed around. Um, they will keep lie low and try to not to get involved too much. You must keep in mind that, that the U.S.'s allies are major investors in Southeast Asia. Japan is the first investor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and South Korea and Taiwan both have southward-looking policies towards towards ASEAN. So the U.S. is in a comfortable situation that, uh, that those countries plus Australia are there in a sense to, to protect, you know, or to promote a U.S. In interest, at least indirectly, with ASEAN. Okay, so ASEAN becoming more and more significant, more and more on the radars of, of more and more countries, it would appear. It certainly looks that way, uh, seen from the outside. Well, we're coming to the end of the uh, first half. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with part two of the France 24 debate. Welcome back to the France 24 debate. Today we're looking at uh, three days of virtual talks for the uh, ASEAN summit, which has now uh, wrapped up. Those talks hosted by uh, Brunei. Uh, lots was discussed. An A to Z of world leaders seem to want to be part of uh, the conversation there with the ASEAN uh, club. One of them was the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, let's listen to what he had to say. ASEAN ki unity or centrality ASEAN's unity and centrality has always been an important priority for India. This special role of ASEAN, India's Act East policy, which is contained in our security and growth for all in the region. That is in the ocean policy. India's Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative and ASEAN's outlook for the Indo-Pacific are our shared vision and framework for mutual cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaking there, saying ASEAN is central to India. Help us understand. Um, if you will, David, what's Narendra Modi talking about there? Because India, of course, isn't a member of ASEAN, is it? No, but uh, as uh, Prime Minister Modi su su suggested, there has been this look east policy that goes back to his predecessor, Manmohan Singh. Um, and there's always been this statements about the interest with ASEAN and developing relations with ASEAN. And of course, there is an, a, an Indian diaspora in countries like, uh, like Singapore, for example, which has a certain degree of importance. Um, but I think uh, ASEAN has become more important since the Quad has become the new kid on the block, so to speak. The Quad is a quadrilateral security arrangement between the US, uh, Japan, India and Australia. And then the, the enunciation and the taking on board by Trump, President Trump, of the notion of the Indo-Pacific. So India was then 
was happy now to have a region in which it was a major player, India, Indo, India uh, but at the same time understood that this was sort of looked upon as perhaps marginalizing ASEAN. So there is a need like for the United States, for the Indians to sort of, they're on the back foot, so they need to kind of, you know, come out with these, these statements to say, yes, we really do believe in ASEAN centrality. Do we think that ASEAN is likely to grow? I mean, any, any suggestions, Cyril, that there could be new members knocking on the door saying, uh, we'd like to sign up? Well, it should, uh, before uh, signing some new members uh, in, should uh, take care of their own because uh, what we have been experiencing for the past uh, years is a big regression, democratically speaking, of some, uh, let's talk about Thailand, which has, was uh, one of the founding members of, of ASEAN, which has, which has in the 1990s a very new uh, constitution, extremely putting the army very behind, and it was extremely uh, modern and evolutive. Um, uh, it's just been uh, backyard uh, extremely because we have uh, a military dictatorship, whatever you call it, in Thailand. Uh, look at the Philippines. The Philippines also was a symbol of democracy, which has been coming back under uh, Duterte, which is leaving soon, but uh, let's see. Uh, Cambodia, for instance. Uh, so there is a shift between the what is the modern ASEAN, uh, long time after his 1967 uh, funding, um, and before signing some people in, they should make some uh, some uh, some space, and also not saying what the, the shift between the ASEAN, uh, like the South uh, uh, China maritime dispute, which is a big big key issue now, which is very much internationalizing. And when I was in the in the Philippines and the, with the fishermen, they were just trying to shoot at some uh, um, uh, Chinese vessels. The same with the Vietnamese, who are just furious of, as China and who are not try not able to make really a block because of the strong influence of China in these waters, for instance. So a lot of things have, have to be done because issues are not really, really addressed uh, during past summit. And, uh, but, well, yes, indeed, America is back. I just recall that Donald Trump never attended any summit. It once, was a, once. Once, sorry, yes. But the, the past two, just empty seat. So Joe Biden made a very big statement yesterday. We could see uh, on this panel and the, and the blue the blue uh, panel for Myanmar, which is also the, the, the new ASEAN, let's say. Let's hope for the best. But I don't believe it is really time for having, uh, and if you talk about East Timor, which is so tiny, so new, so impoverished, what will uh, be the, the add of having the adding thing, I mean, the value of having in East Timor and this... Uh, yeah, East Timor and Papua New Guinea. Sort of, and Papua New yeah, Guinea, yeah. of course. The Singaporean, for example, put a veto on that, um, on East Timor. No, the, the ASEAN is an intergovernmental organization, and it's, it's an organization that strengthens executive authority, irrespective of how the executive has been elected, appointed, a coup d'etat, and everything else. So the fundamental flaw of ASEAN is that there's no agreed model of governance about you know, democracy, semi-democracy, whatever. And as has just been mentioned, there has not been, in fact, democratic backsliding. You know, a few years ago, we could talk about a you know, a semi-democratic kind of model prior to... Uh, but now, now we've got a divided ASEAN with, you know, one-party states like Vietnam and dysfunctional democracies like, like the Philippines um, and everything in between. Uh, and so unless this is a kind of... Uh, you know, in the charter, there's talks about good governance and, and democracy. democracy. It comes seventh in the principles, it should be said, uh, so not really a priority. Uh, but, uh, you know, unless there's a kind of sense of what the unwritten rules of club membership are that other than non-interference, uh, it's difficult to see ASEAN being able to, to move forward. Sure. And uh, I mean, just to ask Jean-Michel Jean Lacombe, who was at uh, one time based in uh, Bangladesh or was ambassador for Bangladesh, um, representing France. I mean, that's one of the countries, along with Sri Lanka and Fiji, that is perhaps rumoured to be perhaps next in line. I mean, do you see ASEAN uh, as likely to grow in, in, in numbers in, in the years ahead? If they grow, then they will be even more inefficient than they are now. <laughs> so, uh, I, they can, yes, of course. Uh, there is a, a, a always a permanent temptation of, of, of forum shopping around. Uh, but uh, clearly what I see is not new members uh, joining, but what I see is a confrontation between China and the United States. Now, uh, if you want to have another problem, you have 
Bangladesh overflooded with Rohingya and uh, from Burma, and that will be another difficult point between uh, a new member of, uh, of ASEAN and uh, an old member of ASEAN. Uh, Myanmar is massing, is uh, uh, organizing what we might see as a military offensive in that area. And I hope uh, uh, this is what will happen. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Bangladesh, uh, I don't think Bangladesh is very, frankly, is very much interested in joining ASEAN, unless they can get some uh, assistance and cooperation uh, to alleviate uh, poverty. Sure, and, and just picking up on Myanmar now, because uh, that was one of the uh, one of the first things you, you mentioned to us, that Jean Michel, uh, and you were based in Myanmar. I mean, how united do you think the ASEAN members were in how they handled this uh, situation in in Myanmar, which presented itself at the beginning of this year? Um, I don't think they wanted to deal with the problem, quite frankly, but they had to. They had been pushed in that direction by the United States. And as I told you before, it has happened. Uh, at, in 2006, I think, uh, the ASEAN sum summit should have happened in uh, Rangoon. And um, ASEAN told clearly to the military junta that this was not going to happen. So, uh, unless they wanted to have a real summit with head of states, well, they should pass their turn and wait a little more. So, um, Myanmar is uh, a problem for ASEAN, and I don't think they want to get deeply involved in uh, the situation. They will, of course, uh, try to be helpful. Uh, the Some ASEAN country were involved in the transition when the military decided to hand over, I mean, to give a constitution, sort of constitution, to the country and accept uh, uh, elections, free and fair elections. Um, but uh, uh, Indonesia, for instance, helped a lot for those negotiations. Thailand also, and they were all ASEAN country, and they were meeting within the ASEAN framework. Now, um, the present situation uh, is, I'm afraid, uh, beyond the reach of ASEAN. Uh, we are heading for a kind of civil war. And uh, I think uh, ASEAN is uh, staying put for the time being. David. Yes, I mean, we're not just heading for a civil war. I think we're already in the civil war. Uh, and it's going to enter into a rather bloody stage because we now know that the the Tatmandu, the military, have uh, brought together about 30,000 elite troops uh, to attack Chin and the northern part of, uh, of, of, of Myanmar. If I can bring the cat amongst the pigeons, um, ASEAN has not expelled uh, Myanmar. Uh, there are other representatives are still attending meetings. And there's no provision in the charter to actually expel a member. And my question is, perhaps the Myanmar military want to be isolated, they want to be expelled. And there's a long history of this. Uh, you know, in the 60s, under the first dictator, Ni Win, uh, Burma refused to join the non-aligned movement because to join the non-aligned movement would, be, would mean being aligned. Okay, so they wanted to be isolated. Under Tan Shui, when Myanmar joined ASEAN in 1997, there was opposition within the military. It was pushed by Kim Nunt, encouraged by the Chinese, but there were conservative generals who were unhappy about that because they said, oh, if we join ASEAN, we're going to be subject to foreign inter inter intervention. Now, I wonder if Min Ain Lung is not actually of the same kind of, the same kind of class of, of generals or group of generals, conservative generals, who are, um, you know, are, are pleased that they can then get on with the only thing they know how to do, which is repression and violence, uh, and they're not seeking a political solution. I mean, they could have made a, a token effort, you know, which was simply to allow the, the special envoy to meet Aung San Suu Kyi. 
and they didn't do that. Uh, um, so uh, you know, there's no goodwill on the side of, of the military. Uh, ASEAN's hope or its expressed hope that there should be dialogue, any political solution, it means that there's got to have you know, two people willing to dialogue. That is not the case. Mm. Uh, and do we think that uh, ASEAN reached this decision not to have Myanmar present by itself, or do you think there was some pressure on no, it's ASEAN? Impossible. Impossible. They were. They would. They, they would have been some. Some pressures. Some pressures for the newcomers, the Americans, of course. Uh, pressures also inside because yeah. Myanmar is, is 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 a problem for. Uh, we're not talking about. Um, we're not speaking about uh, politically uh, with regards to what you said yeah. uh, about the structure of ASEAN. But uh, if you look at the West uh, on Indian border, you have some people moving now in India. Thousands. Uh, in, exactly in the in the Arakan. Some more Rohingyas are moving. Uh, through the Naf River into Bangladesh, the the traditional huge border, one thousand five hundred kilometers long, from Thailand between Thailand and 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 Myanmar in Burma, uh, is also a huge humanitarian problem. It's also a sanctuary for people training to uh, combat uh, the the military, the Tatmadaw. So it's be it's becoming really something which is more than a just a, a economic issue. You have a lot of mm. migrations of things at stake. Without saying, mentioning that uh, the the new power in terms of factories of uh, manufacturing is uh, the, in the past decade, which has been uh, uh, starting in Myanmar, which is like uh, disappearing. And as you very uh, cleverly said, I will say that Milong Leng is even worse if it can that Newin or Tan Shui. We're talking about the, the the dictators of Myanmar, the last ones, because we live now in in in, two, in 2021, and and the Myanmar of this of this period is not very much the same of the century period, and we see what actually is going on there. Uh, 1,200 people which has been killed, uh, hundreds of people disappearing, refugees all around, but also the NUG, the parallel government, and the PDF, the, the force, uh, the, the pro-democratic force, which is attacking nearly every day now the military. And it says that, it said now that you have uh, more than the same a no, no, number, no. maybe more, of informants, soldiers, civil servants working with the Tatmadaw or the military, uh, the military power to be killed by pro-democracy uh, uh, people. So we are already in civil war, and maybe ASEAN members know it very well too. Okay. And, and, and the, 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 step, the way forward would be a recognition of the national unity government, this go government in exile, which, which exists virtually but which is actually talking about a federal constitution, which is actually trying to, to show that it can govern. But that's a step too far, I think, for, for ASEAN. It may be something that, that the Europeans and the Americans should be thinking about, because uh, if there is a recognition of that government, then the right to protect, we've seen in one of the videos, that R2P, the right to protect, can then be invoked by that government once it's recognised in order to get support from the United Nations and for various forms of intervention from the international community. But, uh, you know, that's perhaps at the moment a step too far, but as if things deteriorate, and, and there's already a million uh, Burmese, Myanmar refugees in, in, in Thailand. Um, that river is very, very narrow. I mean, you've probably crossed it as, you know, as easily as, uh, as many of us have. Um, so, you know, th this becomes a humanitarian crisis that, could, that impact with the whole of the community. And I should say that within ASEAN itself, there are democratic forces who, particularly in Indonesia and the Philippines and in Malaysia, who pushed, I think, also for this resolution. So it's not just a product of Western pressure. Um, that I say, you know, what's happening in, in, in Myanmar is, is our business as well, because it's all about also our own civil society. It's also, also about our own democratic rights. Okay, so Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia the more vocal ones when it came to uh, uh, what to do about uh, Myanmar. Let's listen to what the, um, uh, the rotating chair head of ASEAN, the Sultan of Brunei, had to say on this specific issue. Overall, ASEAN member states hope Myanmar will return to normalcy in accordance with the will of its people. For this meeting, we have given Myanmar space while firmly upholding the principles enshrined in the ASEAN Charter, including that of non-interference. Only the people of Myanmar can fully resolve their own 
internal situation. Okay, the uh, Sultan of Brunei there referring to this issue of uh, what to do about Myanmar. And interestingly, he mentioned there the uh, principles enshrined in the ASEAN Charter. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, these entry requirements we talked about, I mean, there do seem to be some standards, aren't there, for uh, keeping members in check? No, the only entry standard is geography. Um, uh, it's interesting that Sri Lanka is thinking about becoming a member because back in 1967, it was foreshadowed, foreshadowed as a possible member. That, that's not going to happen. I mean, uh, it's now geographically what is considered to be Southeast Asia. And East Timor is a little bit tangential. Uh, Papua New Guinea is considered as part of the South Pacific, so unlikely to be allowed to become a member uh, by the other countries. Um, the, uh, it's been a comfortable club of, of golf players, uh, all men. Um, I don't see that they would wish to have this extended. OK. Uh, one of the other new dynamics that they had to talk about and they had to think about there in this virtual summit was the AUKUS deal. And we've been talking about it a bit in the news. Uh, and there is some concern that this uh, submarine deal, this, uh, this nuclear submarine deal and this pact between the UK, Australia and uh, uh, the United States uh, could threaten uh, regional stability. Uh, Indonesia and Malaysia seem to be uh, worried about it, thinking this could lead to some sort of an arms race in the South China Sea. I mean, how much do you think that was weighing on the minds of people uh, taking part? There has been this attempts to try and reassure them, but um, it, it certainly is contrary, or as seen from ASEAN, to the principle of non-proliferation, or the, sorry, rather the zone of peace and stability and neutrality. Um, and uh, it's also seen as dragging uh, ASEAN or the countries of Southeast Asia into this Sino-American conflict in the South China Sea. And that's a long way away. Uh, I mean, there are countries, and this is where I, I, ASEAN is clearly divided. There are countries which have territorial issues with China, the Philippines and Vietnam in particular, and who are uh, the most happy about uh, AUKUS to be... To be, to be uh, uh, fair. Um, whereas others like uh, Thailand and even Myanmar, which don't have territorial issues in the South China Sea, um, they are less sanguine about this, this agreement. So, um, yeah, there is a concern that, that, that it's, it's sort of pushing ASEAN aside from its, this, this so-called central role. OK, just uh, lastly, because we're really running out of time, but Jean-Michel Lacombe, let me just ask you. I mean, China is due to hold a, a joint summit with uh, ASEAN next month. Uh, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, is expected to attend it. I mean, is this China's attempt at perhaps uh, recalibrating this relationship and ad adding a bit of equilibrium? No, uh, I fear that this is... Uh uh, China is clearly having a competition with the United States in uh, in ASEAN. Um, the proposal, the suggestion that uh, President Biden come with a hundred million investment is peanuts compared to what China has been uh, offering and building in uh, in this area. Uh, sometime for their own benefit, most of the time, and sometimes for the benefit of the local uh, population. Now, what the uh, local governments are worried about is the debt uh, trap. That is to say, uh, having lavishly distributed money, China is in a position now more and more to uh, dictate its condition like the American were not so, such a long time ago. Uh, it's just the money that President Biden is putting on the table is okay. not. Okay, nothing uh, without uh, strings and terms and conditions attached. Thank you so much. You've had the last word. We're out of time. Uh, Jean-Michel Lacombe, former ambassador to Bangladesh and Myanmar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to uh, David Camru, uh, professor at Sciences Po here in Paris. Thank you to you. And last but not least, our former regional correspondent and senior reporter, Cyril Payen. Thank you very much indeed to you. Thanks for watching. That was the France 24 debate.